Well, as we come to the Word of God this morning, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you this morning, admitting our dependency upon you. The truths found in your word cannot be discerned by simply natural reason. We need your spirit to illumine your truth for us. And we pray that you would do that this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, with the new year comes resolutions, and with resolutions come gym memberships. And uh, if you're, a, if you're a, a person that goes to the gym year-round, you know that come January is when it gets crowded. But don't worry, February's coming, right? <laughs> But people go to the gym and, and often have workout resolutions because they, for multiple reasons, but some want to lose weight, some simply want to strengthen themselves and strengthen their muscles. And one aspect of muscle strengthening pursued is the strengthening of one's core, referring to the muscles that make up the lower, lower torso of our bodies. And being central to our bodies, the strength of our core is actually important to all of our movement and our health as people. But just like it's important to keep the core of the body strong, so the core of the church body should be strong as well. In 2005, the elders of this church wrote out five values that had characterized the church in the past up to that point and what they hoped would shape and characterize its future. These are known as our core values. Now, many of you are no doubt familiar with our core values, but I would guess that it's been a while since most of you read them, much less seriously thought about our core values. And so with that in mind, I thought it would be helpful for us here as we launch into a new year and in a new decade, for us as a body to think on and look at these essential values that make up our fellowship here. So starting today and the Sundays coming, we will be looking each week at one of these core values. And today we will look at the first core value, which simply states, we are devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when I mention the word devotion, what comes to your mind? No doubt there's some sort of religious connotation when you hear the word devotion. People think of almost religious fanatics when they hear about religious devotion, those who go to great lengths to, to fulfill religious duties or rituals. Think of those who are ever so faithful in their religious duties or in giving to religious organizations or in volunteering to advance a religious cause. But what I want us to think about this morning is that it's not just quote-unquote, religious people who are devoted or who have devotion. In fact, people display their devotion every day to one thing or another. I mean, think about this. People are devoted to sports teams. You only have to turn on the TV during a, a major NFL game to see people devoted to a sports team. People are devoted to fashion and clothing brands. Certain items of clothing that they want to broadcast to the world that they are wearing and they love that brand. Social causes. People are devoted to all sorts of things in this world. People are devoted to political candidates. The certain person that they think will solve all the problems. People are devoted to hobbies and recreational activities. They're, 
the, guy, the people that you know who are always spending time somewhere, doing something, always in the garage working on X, or they're devoted to their, their hobbies and recreational activities. People are devoted to instruments and to music. A person who, who's always spending time practicing that instrument and, and maybe playing with that band or whatnot. And people are devoted to their jobs. I mean, that's where the term workaholic comes from, is that they are so devoted to their job that they have given their life to it. They are a devotee of their jobs. And so the, the point being that people are all about all sorts of things. They give their time, they give their money, they give their voice to supporting any number of things. And what this shows is that we were made with an innate desire and capacity for devotion. Devotion to something is built into our DNA. We can't be devotionless people. We have to be devoted to something. It's natural for humans to give themselves wholeheartedly to something. And yet, with that being the case, with that being ingrained in us, what is worth giving our lives to? What is worth devoting ourselves to? Is there anything in this universe worthy of mankind's collective devotion? We can see that people are naturally devoted to things, but is there anything that we all should be devoted to? Well, differing worldviews answer this question in different ways. And connected to this question of what to be devoted to is also the question of what will bring about the best good for humanity. And again, each worldview, whether religious or secular, puts forward an answer to what you should be devoted to and what would be best for you. What would be best for your well-being, for your future, and for your joy? New Age pantheistic spirituality offers wholeness through meditation and connection with the divine spirit all around us. It says to stop thinking as an individual and to realize you're really a part of the God force. The worldview of Marxism calls people to devote their lives to revolution and to the establishment of a new social order in which all conflicts will be solved. It presents a promise of harmonious society through socialism and communism. And most prevalent in our society, I believe, is just a general sense that we exist for our own good. That every individual exists for himself or herself. And the more we devote ourselves to our own happiness and to our own agenda, the better off we will be. Follow your heart. Do what you want to do. That's the best for you. Individualism and personal auto autonomy rule the day. And we've been indoctrinated of our evolutionary beginnings in which we are just advanced animals trying to be the fittest on this planet so that we can survive and be above the rest. In summary, people are devoted to themselves because they believe that's what's best for themselves. And yet, the Christian worldview can not only explain why people are devoted to things the way that they are, but it provides an alternative and offers the only hope for humanity. As we know in God's Word, that He calls us to be exclusively devoted to Jesus Christ. It's only through renouncing ourselves and confessing Jesus that we find life. In fact, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Where Jesus makes this abundantly clear. Luke 9, starting in verse 23. Jesus speaking says, Luke 9, 23, And he said to all, 
If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. It is only through confessing Jesus as Lord that we are transformed and restored to God's original plan for mankind. We were, we were created for the glory of God, to exalt in and delight in God's glory. We were made to treasure that glory above everything else. But we, along with the rest of humanity, have fallen. We are, mankind is not wholeheartedly devoted to God. In fact, we have turned away from God. And we suppress the truth about God, Romans 1 tells us. We have exchanged the glory of God for lesser things found on this earth. We've exchanged the Creator with the creature in our hearts. And in this, we found our souls shriveled, our joy dissipated, and we're left really wondering why we even exist. In the opening chapter to his book, Seeing and Savoring Jesus Christ, Pastor John Piper has written some helpful words. These are an extended quote for us this morning, but I believe it's it's helpful. He writes this, The point is this. We were made to know and treasure the glory of God above all things. And when we trade that treasure for images, everything is distorted. The sun of God's glory was made to shine at the center of the solar system of our souls. And when it does, all the planets of our life are held in proper orbit. But when the sun is displaced, everything flies apart. The healing of the soul begins by restoring the glory of God to its flaming, all-attractive place at the center. But then he makes this crucial statement. He says, we are all starved for the glory of God, not self. No one goes to the Grand Canyon to increase self-esteem. Why do we go? Because there is greater healing for the soul in beholding splendor than there is in beholding self. Indeed. What could be more ludicrous in a vast and glorious universe like this than being a human being on a speck called earth, standing in front of a mirror trying to find significance in his own self-image? It is a great sadness that this is the gospel of the modern world. But he goes on. But this is not the Christian gospel. Into the darkness of petty preoccupation has shown the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 2 Corinthians 4 4. The Christian gospel is about the glory of Christ, not about me. And when it is in some measure about me, it's not about my being made much of by God, but about God mercifully enabling me to enjoy making much of Him forever. Folks, we were made to treasure the glory of Christ, not ourselves. And we, the church, have been saved from that preoccupation to self and have had the eyes of our hearts opened to see our sin and rebellion and to see the beauty of Jesus Christ in a way that's not possible on our own. And it's at that moment of conversion when you first believed in Jesus, that you devoted your life to Him. Because He owns us. He is our Lord. Lord meaning master or king over us. Jesus isn't just a consultant to help us get through life. Jesus is our Lord and master from which We bow and we submit and we love. He's the one we serve. He's the one we adore. He's the one we delight in. 
You see, being devoted to Jesus is not like being devoted to some hobby. Being devoted to Jesus means that he's our Lord and Master, and nothing else can fill that space. Jesus said in Luke 16, verse 13, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Saying you cannot serve God in money, as what he was talking about at that time, but you could really put anything in that last space for money. You cannot serve God in anything else. There must be an ultimate allegiance of our souls. And Jesus can be the only one who fills that space. That is what it means to be a Christian. To be a follower of Jesus means that Jesus holds that center place in our heart, in our life. And so this is what the elders in 2005 and we today want to affirm is a core value of who we are as individuals and who we are as a church, is that we are devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, I want us to look at this by asking and answering three questions. Asking and answering three questions. The, I want to begin by asking the question, why are we devoted to Jesus Christ? Why are we devoted to Jesus? Why can we even make this one of our core values? Which might be kind of a funny question. In one sense, you might say, you've already answered that. Well, I think it's important for us to think about. Because the answer is not that we're clever. We aren't devoted to Jesus because we evaluated the cost-benefit analysis of, of being devoted to Jesus or not being devoted to Jesus, and this one made the most sense, and so we went with that. You see, if you're here this morning and you've trusted in Jesus for the eternal salvation of your soul, then that was only possible because God in his mercy chose you for himself. In love, he predestined you for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. The fundamental reality of the fact that when we look at our own devotion and our own allegiance to Jesus, we have to be drawn back up the stream to realize that we're only here and we only have any desire for Jesus because He loved us first. We love Him because He first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. We love Him because He first loved us. In fact, the Apostle John makes it clear that we cannot claim that we loved God first and that because of our love for God, then God chose to love us. He says, oh, I love that love from them. I guess I'll love them too. No. 1 John 4.10 says, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God took the initiative. God moved towards us who, let me remind you, were his enemies to redeem his enemies and to save his enemies. Like we heard earlier, God's salvation of us does not speak to our greatness, that we're so great that God would choose us. No, but it simply speaks to God's grace to those who are not only undeserving of his grace, but we're actually ill-deserving. We're actually deserving of his wrath. And yet the tables have turned. And so he enables us to see his greatness and his glory and in that find the satisfaction our souls long for. If you are here today and you have not trusted in Christ for your salvation. You are still the Lord and master of your life. Then the Bible says that you are headed towards destruction. That to be devoted to yourself is not the path of life, but is the path of death. And so I invite you to look 
at the love that God has displayed in the sending of His own Son. He, in His love, saw you as an enemy and sent His Son to die on the cross to take the punishment that your sins deserved. And what God calls you to do is to repent of your sin, turn away from it, and trust wholly in Jesus for your salvation, to bow before Him as Lord and Master and submit to Him with your life. And in that, find life. Don't go home today without knowing that life. I'd be happy to talk with you after the service if you have any further questions to show you how you might know the love of God and to walk in that life. For those of us that follow Jesus, we cannot think of our devotion to God as arising out of our own initiative or that our devotion to God can in any way pay God back. That God, I know you did a big, a great thing for me. You, you sent your son. Thank you so much. Um, let, me try to, let me try to pay you back. I'll do all these things for you and maybe in some way it'll make up for all that you've done for me. <laughs> That's a fool's errand. We cannot do anything to pay God back. Any good that we see in our life, even any inkling of devotion and love for God, any desire for Him is a gift. If you love God today, it's because God gave you that love. Not because you conjured it up. Not because you did X, Y, and Z, and so therefore now you've produced this in you. Pat on my back. No. It's all because of the, the awesome grace of God. As the hymn writer teaches us we are debtors to grace every day. Because each time that we seek to show our devotion to God, we're having to draw from that grace even more. We're pulling more out of the grace bank account. And so we're just more and more debtors every day. And that's the way God intended it, so that he gets all the glory. Our salvation is all of grace. So, As we look to strengthen our devotion to Christ this year, let us begin by giving all thanks and praise to him who loved us first. Amen? Second question I want us to ask this morning is not why do we show devotion, but, but how do we show our devotion? What does it look like? Our core value that was, again, crafted in 2005 outlines three areas, three ways that this devotion manifests itself in our lives. And as we go through these, I encourage you to use these categories as really a self-check diagnosis on the condition of your devotion to Christ here at the beginning of 2020. The first way that we show our devotion is genuine worship as a way of life. Genuine worship as a way of life. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. The Gospel of John, chapter 4. This is the account where Jesus meets the woman at the well in Samaria. He gets into a conversation with her uh, that begins very personally about her own condition before, spiritual state before God and And she seems to uh, divert the conversation to talking about the differences between Samaritans and Jews. And Jesus rolls along with her talking about worship. And and she's wondering, where is true worship? Is it at our mountain here in Samaria or is it in Jerusalem where the Jews say? And Jesus answers her in verse 21. says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, Jesus is making it clear here in this passage that a new era of worship was coming. 
This woman was based upon the, the, the understanding of the day that you went to a certain shrine or a certain temple, a certain place in order to worship the true God. In fact, the ancient understanding of gods were very territorial. So that each nation have their own gods, and once you crossed into the other nation, that was the territory of that god, and you left your god at the border. But Jesus here is, is making explicitly clear that a new era is coming. Then neither at this mountain or at the mountain in Jerusalem are you going to go to worship the Father, the true God. And he's saying that it, it, it's now here and the hour is coming, meaning he was referencing himself. That because I am here, I am the Son of God, and because of my future death and resurrection, I am open in a new way to which people can worship me anywhere. That it's not going to be restricted to a certain location. Previously, true and false worshipers could be known by which location they frequented. But now, worship, worship would be set free from a particular location, and the determiner of genuine worship would be whether they worshipped in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? What does spirit and truth reference? Jesus is saying that God accepts worship offered in spirit, meaning through the power of God's Holy Spirit, which was given through Jesus Christ. And secondly, that it's offered in truth, meaning that the, our worship is according to the truth laid out in the Word of God. It's according to the truth of God. It's possible for people to think that they're worshiping God, but it's really a God of their own imagination. It's a God of their own concoction, some hodgepodge of ideas about God that they pull together, and it's not in truth according to the truth of God. And so Jesus says, we don't worship God in the flesh, we worship in the Spirit. And we don't worship Him based upon our own ideas about God, we worship God in truth. And what this shows is that God cares about our worship. He cares about the worship that we offer to God every day. And folks, we must be a worshiping people. If we are devoted to Jesus Christ, our Lord, then worship must be a way of life for us every single day. Worship is not just limited to Sundays. It's not just limited to a, a time of song. And it's not just some sort of time of undistracted meditation. Oh, I'll get into a point or a position of, of worship when I can push all distractions aside necessarily. As we see throughout the Scriptures, worship is just a daily expression of the Christian life. We live all of life Coram Deo, which means before the face of God, which means all through our day, every day, we have an opportunity to relate to God, and in all of those ways we relate to God is worship. Worship happens when we praise God, which is probably the most common way that we talk about it. But worship happens when we pray, when we depend, when we trust, when we thank, when we ascribe when we cry out, when we delight, when we rest. You see, as we go through our days, we have opportunities to worship God all of the time. As we experience maybe the good gifts of God, maybe going through a time or, or, or there's a particular point in your day that you're really enjoying. As we enjoy those good gifts, our souls must see the gift and travel back up to the giver of the good gift and thank God and praise Him for all that we've received. Or maybe as we experience a difficult part of our day or week or year, we must cast our cares upon the Lord, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, because He cares for us. Or as we heard in Psalm 46 this morning, that, that He is an ever-present help in time of trouble. And we must run to Him and rest on His power and His wisdom in the midst of our difficulties. He's worshipped as we depend. Or maybe we're in a period of waiting and we don't know what's coming next and we're anxious. We can worship God at those times too because when we trust in Him with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding but acknowledge Him, He's glorified and He's magnified because we're not trusting in ourselves but we're trusting on the rock. 
We're trusting the only one that can get us through, the only one with wisdom, the only one with strength. He's glorified and worshiped as we trust him. Or maybe we find ourselves depleted and spent. God is worshiped as we cry out to him for strength. He wants to be depended upon by his children, and when we do, he's glorified and worshiped. As we're faced with temptation, we must cry out, to God to save us and to lead our souls, to delight in Him alone. Again, He's worshipped as we cry out in those prayers. In all these circumstances and many more, God is exalted because, there, because we can depend upon Him and we can trust in Him and we can praise Him in any circumstance of life. And friends, this is how we worship Him as a way of life. It, we fit it in and we, we respond to him in the ebb and flow of our day. But the second way that we can display this devotion for Jesus is not only in worship as a way of life, but in sincere love for the church. Sincere love for the church. Turn with me to John chapter 13. John 13 verse 34. John 13, verse 34. Jesus says this in the upper room, the night he was betrayed, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus makes it clear that his disciples would evidence their allegiance to him by their love for one another. And this is the message that these disciples who heard this message passed on down to the church and to us today. Just remind you of a couple of verses in 1 John. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. 1 John 3.14 We know that we've passed out of death to life. We know that we've been regenerated by the Spirit of God because of the love we have for the brothers and sisters. 1 John 4.11 Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The gospel transforms us to love other Christians. This becomes a new, deeper family than blood relations. Paul instructs the church we see in Colossians chapter 3 in same sort of way. In Colossians 3 verse 12 he says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all these things, he says, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Love is to characterize the church. Love is to characterize believers. We know that we belong to Jesus if we have a sincere love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So I ask you, how is your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ? How is your love for the people of this church? Well, what does it mean to love the church? What does it mean to have a sincere love for our brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, as John says, just as God has loved us, so we also ought to love our brothers. So we need to follow Christ's example to us. The way that God loves us is a way that we need to love others. And so we know that it's not based upon merit. In other words, our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ is not just a love that's directed towards them because they do certain things for me or because they uh, live a certain way and so because you've reached a certain standard, I'm now going to love you. Our love for our brothers and sisters is not based upon how good the other person is or what they do for us. 
It's an unconditional kind of love, an agape love, the same kind of love that God shows us. It's a love that is truly wants what is best for the other person. It's a love that's not just being nice. There's a lot of people that are nice in this world, but that's not what the Bible calls us to, for us just to be nice Christians. It calls us to love, which means we've got a desire deep down to do what is best for our brothers and sisters. And therefore, it's also willing to sacrifice. It's willing to put it into action to do something for our brothers and sisters. And so as we are devoted to Jesus, as we love him, it will manifest itself in our lives by loving the people around us. It causes us to serve those around us and looking to bless the church. In 1 Corinthians 16, the Apostle Paul reminds the Corinthians of a believer that he wants to put forward as an example. And I believe it's a good example for us. He says in 1 Corinthians 16, 15, Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. These were the first converts in this region, and they devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Devotion to Jesus translates in devotion to service. How's your service here at the start of 2020? How's your action towards the church and brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you look for needs and ways to serve the saints? Are you looking for ways to bless the people in your small group or Other people you sit next to at church? Are you just waiting for some need to fall across your path or are you actually proactively looking for ways to come alongside people? This service is what distinguishes between people who are just being nice and put on a smile and those who are truly, sincerely loving. Let's pray that God might grow our love for one another and our service for one another, that we might be sincere in our love for each other based upon what Christ, how Christ has loved us. Because as Jesus said in John 13, all people will know that we are Jesus' disciples by our love for one another. Therefore, our witness for Christ depends upon how well we serve each other. If we are not serving and loving one another, our witness for Christ is being hindered and hampered. The third way that we can see devotion for Christ manifest in our life, worship, sincere love, thirdly, personal holiness. Personal holiness. You can turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22. Let's actually get a little bit of context. Look at, <clears throat> go back to verse 16. Galatians 5, 16. Apostle Paul writing says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, 
envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and the desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. This passage describes this great battle that goes on in every believer's heart. This reality, this battle between the flesh and the spirit. That even though we've been saved and we've been given the Holy Spirit, there is still our sin nature that resides within us. There are still inclinations towards evil, a heart that is desperately wicked and can draw us towards sin if we're not fighting. And So what Paul is laying out here for the Galatians is that if they are following the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ in them, then they will do battle against their flesh. They will not follow their flesh into all of these works that he lays out, this long list of sins, but instead they will be submitted to Jesus. They will be uh, looking to live according to the Word of God, and therefore the Spirit will produce this wonderful fruit in a believer's life. This fruit, which really could be characterized as the characteristics of Christ. This is the character of Christ in the believer. You could, each one of these, you can, you can point to Jesus and say, Jesus was love. Jesus is joy. Jesus is peace. Jesus is patience. He embodies and exemplifies every single one of these. And so if we are going to be devoted to Jesus Christ, then we must be seeking to submit ourselves to the Scriptures and seeking to put on the character of Christ. We've got to care about how we live. We cannot simply be devoted to Jesus in confession only, but not see it play out in our everyday life in our battle with sin. Because that sin in our lives is evidence of pieces of rebellion in our hearts. And to do war, to put to death, to crucify that, is to acknowledge it for what it is, to call it by its biblical name, to confess it and to repent of it, to turn it, turn 180 degrees and go the other direction. And in this, as we produce, as we seek to put on the character of Christ, we will be striving after holiness. Holiness is a term in the Bible used to describe the character of God. God is holy, therefore we should be holy. In fact, that's what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We are, as the writer of Hebrews says, to strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Holiness is important if we want to see Jesus. Therefore, we must strive for that holiness. Well, how do we pursue holiness in our personal lives? Well, there is a, Paul lays out a simple three-step process in Ephesians chapter 4. So, if Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Starting in verse 22. Saying, verse 21, assuming that you heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. So this is, this is the truth you learned about Jesus. Verse 22. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And verse 24. To put on the new self, 
created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Folks, this is a a simple three-step process that the Apostle Paul gives us for how we can deal with the sin in our life, how we can pursue holiness. We first recognize what it is in our life that we need to put off, that we need to get rid of. The words here, put off and put on, using the Greek words for putting on a jacket or taking off a, a garment or taking off a jacket. Very visual. We've got to take off whatever it is that is sin, whatever it is that displeases the Lord, whatever it is that goes against the Word of God. Put it away. No longer be associated with it. Put it far from you. Because that does not belong to your new self. That belongs to your old self. That belongs to the old manner of life, which is corrupt through deceitful desires. But it's not just put off, put on. There's a middle step. He says put off and then be renewed in the spirit of your minds. How are we renewed in the spirit of our minds and in our hearts? We need truth. We need the spirit of God to renew our minds. And we do that through the word of God. We need to go to the Bible and say, what does God say about this behavior, about this sin, about this activity? What is it that that I'm thinking wrong about this? Why why is it that I'm so drawn and so tempted to, to act in these ways? What is it in me that is corrupt, that that is not Christ-like, but instead is is more associated with my old way of life. And through the Scriptures and reprogramming our mind with truth, our, our minds are renewed, and we begin to think like Christ. So now when that temptation presents itself, it's not as attractive as it once were because we want to see it as Christ sees it. And we want to see righteousness as Christ sees it. So we must put off, disassociate. We must be renewed in the spirit of our minds through the scriptures and through prayer. And then we put on the new self. We endeavor through the power of the spirit to obey in new ways. God, please help me to to obey in this way. Please help me to, to act this way, act differently next time that temptation hits. We must have new behaviors. We can't simply put off the old and think that we're just going to be different. We have to endeavor to put on new behaviors. We've got to replace it with something. And as Paul gives examples in the verses following this, saying that the one who who steals, he needs to stop stealing. That's the put off. But he also now needs to work in order to be generous and give. It's not just stop stealing. It's work so you can be generous and give. It's putting on something new in its place. And so as we are here at the start of 2020, what is the sin that is in your life that has been there and, and festering in your heart and you keep shoving it aside, you keep trying to push it into that dark corner and not really deal with it? What do you need to repent of? Not excusing the sin, Oh, well, you know, life's hard right now, and so I can kind of allow this sin to continue. Or, you know, this is just my, my tendency. I just happen to be this way. We need to call sin, sin, brothers and sisters. And we need to repent. Not just admitting that it's wrong and then go on, but repentance is a 180-degree turn. It's leaving it in the dust leaving it behind and turning towards what is true. We need to ask, what does God's word say about this sin? And what's the Christ-like behavior that needs to replace it? May this new year be one in which you love Christ through pursuing personal holiness and fighting the sin in your heart. May we be a community of people that are devoted to, to Christ as manifested through personal holiness. Well, we've seen why are we devoted to Christ, how are we devoted to Christ. Our final question for this morning is how do we strengthen our devotion? 
And in one sense, we've been hinting at this all morning, but I want to close this out by looking at, suggest three ways that we can strengthen our core, strengthen the core value of devotion to Christ in this new year. The first way is to recognize the dangers of drifting and deception. To recognize the dangers of drifting and deception. We cannot coast in our affection for Christ. We cannot assume that everything will stay as it is. No doubt, for those of you who have been a Christian for any length of time, you know that our devotion and affection for God can wane. The eagerness and energy with which we followed Christ at one time dissipates, and we find ourselves somewhat half-hearted towards Jesus. And our Christian life then lacks the vibrancy it once had. Well, the encouraging thing is that the Scriptures understand this dynamic. They understand this danger of drifting. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, Paul expresses his concern for the believers in Corinth for this very thing. He says, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband, to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now this passage is in the context of false teachers who had crept into the church, and he's, Paul's afraid that these false teachers are going to cause the believers there to be led away from Christ. But Paul, what Paul understood for the believers there is same true today, that even though that there is those who claim to follow Christ and profess to, to believe in Him, that there is a real danger of drifting away. And that this is exactly what the serpent or the enemy, the devil, would want for each one of us. The enemy does not want any one of us to be on fire for Jesus. He doesn't want any one of us to be wholeheartedly devoted to Christ in 2020. He wants us to think that we're devoted to Christ and continue ho-hum through life and, and, and think that, that everything's okay. And he knows that he probably can't convince us to just jettison Jesus. So he comes in and, and seeks to deceive us. And he lulls Christians. And he distracts them so that their love for Christ goes, grows cold. And this can happen in many different ways. He might do it by drifting people away from the fellowship, away from church. Like a coal that is removed from a fire loses its heat and its light. So a Christian removed from the church loses his love for Christ. The Christians can have their love for God choked out by the things of the world. And we have so many things to distract us. The entertainment and and the screens in our pockets, and, and everything that's all around us, while they can be tools for good, they can also be tools for distraction that can lead us away to devote our energies to that which is not eternal. Has that happened to you? What's keeping you, what's choking out your affection for Christ? What's keeping you from the Word of God? You know, there was a church in the New Testament whose affection for Christ had drifted, and, and Jesus called him out on it. I mean, how convicting is that for Jesus, the Savior, the Lord of the church, to uh, send a letter to your church and say, you've lost your affection for me. But that's what happened to Ephesus, as recorded in Revelation chapter 2. Jesus said this, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And there we have the emphasis of repentance again. We need to look in our heart, in our life, and see if our affection for Christ has waned at all. And if it's true, we need to repent as Jesus commands. Not just say, oh, well, sorry, Jesus, I'll try to do better. That's not repentance. Repentance is to call it for the sin that it is, to ask for forgiveness from the Lord, and to plead for His help to help you walk in obedience in the newness of life. The second 
uh, way that we can strengthen our devotion in this new year is to behold the glory of Christ in the Scriptures. Behold the glory of Christ in the Scriptures. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this point. Next week we're talking about the Bible, so um, we'll spend more time then. But the reality is, is we can't grow in our love for Christ if we're not spending time with Him through His Word. It's in the Bible that we behold Jesus. And so we've got to go to the Word. We've got to see Him in all of His glory if we want our affection for Him to grow. If we stay away from the Bible, then it's not going to grow. We must let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, as Paul says in Colossians 3.16. So we go to our Bible asking that God would grow our affection for Christ. And this leads us then to the final way that we can strengthen our devotion. And that is to commit ourselves to obedience in prayer. Commit ourselves to obedience in prayer. And these these two are intentionally linked together. Because as we've been saying, our obedience cannot just be done in the flesh. We can't just try harder to love Jesus. We've got to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who's at work within us. We have to step out in obedience pleading and asking that God would work in us and strengthen us. You cannot single-handedly increase your devotion for God. You can't single-handedly in your flesh just be a better Christian and be more on fire. You're powerless to do that. We all are. And that's why we've got to plead and ask that God would please strengthen us. God, you want me to be inflamed with love for you, so please work this in me. Please help me to obey today. You see, devotion to Jesus is not just a heart attitude. It's not just this warm fuzzy that we get and say, mm, I love you, Jesus, and that's it. Devotion to Jesus translates, as I've, we said earlier, into every aspect of our lives. Jesus is Lord over all. His claim is over the entire universe. In fact, it was the theologian Abraham Kuyper who famously said in the 19th century that there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ does not declare mine. There's not one square inch. Everything belongs to Jesus. All moments and and minutes of your day belong to Jesus. Everywhere you go belongs to Jesus. Therefore, our devotion for him should follow us into all those places. We cannot say we're devoted to Christ and yet live by our desires Monday to Saturday. We cannot say we're devoted to Christ and yet do whatever just pleases us. If we are devoted to Christ, then our everyday lives should reflect that. Our entertainment choices should reflect our devotion. Our financial choices should reflect our devotion. Our voting choices should reflect our devotion. Our purchases should reflect our devotion. Our thought life should be directed by our devotion to Jesus. Our speech should be directed by our devotion to Jesus. And so as we look to strengthen our devotion to Jesus in this new year. Let us pray and ask God that he would help us to be devoted to him with renewed passion. We must strive to obey. We can't just sit back and say, God, do this in me. No, we've got to obey. We've got to work out our salvation. There's work to do, but we do it in complete dependence upon the Lord. Folks, I pray that Foothill Bible Church in 2020 would not be able to be characterized in any way, individually or corporately, as being half-hearted. May God work in us that we may be wholehearted on fire for Christ. Amen? Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Our Father, we confess that we, in this life, will never have the affection and devotion to match the worthiness of your Son. We will all go to the grave having fallen short of what Jesus truly deserves. And yet, we want to be growing and striving in our devotion for Christ. To say that He means everything to us. That we are happily submitted to Him, enjoying Him, Father, I pray that we would be a people that not only seek to obey Christ in all things, 
but may we find our greatest joy, our greatest satisfaction in beholding the glory of Christ. May you do this in us, not so that we can take any sort of credit or be proud about any, any sort of growth, but so that we can turn that growth directly back into worship and praise to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.